All right, welcome everyone. My name is Arno van Widem. I work for Bitcoin Magazine. I also just wrote a book called The Genesis Book. This will be released in January, which is about, uh, it's the origin story of Bitcoin. So the, the prehistory of Bitcoin, essentially. I'm joined by four panelists who are going to introduce themselves. So let's start here on the right, my right. So my name is Daniel Baden, and I'm the founder of CH4 Capital. So we specialize in methane mitigation through Bitcoin mining companies who are using landfill gas, which is currently directly venting into the atmosphere. <coughs> Hello, I am Sebastian. I am a French miner, and uh, um, I do mining uh, for eight years now everywhere in the world in difficult uh, countries in general. Hello, my name is Guy Zangane. I'm the CEO of um, Acme Swiss Tech, which is um, a Swiss company active in the field of renewables and mining for small medium enterprises. And um, we work with Tether to erect and operate their mining business. Hey, I'm Bjorn. Uh, I'm the founder of Penguin. Penguin. At Penguin, we transform energy into human potential. We are utilizing hydro energy in Paraguay, hosting one of our most important group is Bitcoin miners, and then reinvesting these uh, funds that we are generating there into training people to program and changing their mindset through, st through that. All right, so on this panel, we're going to discuss misconceptions about mining, about Bitcoin mining. Um, but let's start at the beginning. Why do we, why is mining a thing? Or rather, why do we use proof of work for mining? Why don't we use proof of stake? Who wants to take this first? Bjorn, you, uh, are you, oh, I, I guess everyone has a mic. That, <laughs> I thought you were the only one with the mic. Who wants to start? <laughs> Why, it's a big, why proof it's a of big work? Issue. There's two ways to answer this question. Uh, you know, proof of stake is not a way to create a decentralized currency. It's as simple as that. If you want to have a currency which is going to be a potential global currency with all the security features that you need of a global currency, then it has to be really, really hard to hack the network. It has to be incredibly secure. And proof of stake is a system which will work for other altcoins, I'm going to call them charitably. Um, but it's not a system that's going to work for something that can be global money. Uh, that's a simple way to explain it. Why not, though? Um, I don't understand the question. <laughs> <laughs> why? <laughs> why? Why proof of work and not proof of stake? That's, that's a bit... But, but there's, does not subject and the proof of work gives uh, satisfaction so why thinking about proof of stake there's no, no it's a nonsense for me because for the question has a sense only if uh, proof of work um, has a as a problem as an issue for me it's not the case it's very positive i explained it this morning in, in view to develop the, the new electricity in, uh, in countries, uh, in development countries. So I don't see the interest to think about uh, changing the, the code. Well, it requires a lot of energy, right? To give. Yeah, I think, well, that's actually the point, right? So the energy that you're using for proof of work is actually what is giving security to the Bitcoin network, and that's the whole point. Um, compared to proof of stake, where basically you just have to have money to be a validator or secure the network, which is kind of uh, antithetical to what Bitcoin is all about. So the idea is like you have to actually invest in infrastructure, you have to actually buy things, you have to actually educate people, you have to have people who run an operation. <clears throat> so you have to actually prove that you have done a work and a significant work, you have to secure power, um, and this in turn secures the Bitcoin network. So it just makes it much more difficult to, for, um, for, uh, um, for a bad actor to attack it or to try to intervene with it compared to proof of stake where you just basically have to have a bunch of money on ac or accumulate enough of those coins to have a, to have a say in its security. Yeah, well, do you have anything to add, Bjorn? I, I would like to just repeat what you just said. It's exactly that, right? It's very difficult to centralize all the energy supply in the world and to own it. It's 
even impossible to own 10% of it, more or less, right? So it's a fair game, it connects it to something real, and I think it's a, it's a very interesting geopolitical thing as well, because power, in a way, is real power now, right? It connects money with power, and it limits it by something. So I think it's extremely important that we keep this uh, proof of work running, and we don't fall into the, the fallacy of creating something that ultimately will be ending up centralized. All right, so let's move to the sort of logical follow-up question. The critique, or the main critique, or one of the critiques of proof of work is that it's bad for the environment, essentially. So is there any truth to this claim? Shall we move in the other direction, Bjorn? Is, is proof of work mining destroying the environment? <laughs> so I think it, it really depends on uh, how you look at it, right? And what newspaper you read, so and what statistics you believe. But uh, I think one very interesting thing is that there is a race to zero in Bitcoin mining. That means that it's more and more unprofitable, basically, or you need to use more and more uh, marginalized power in order to run successfully uh, Bitcoin mining. And so that means that all the prime power that is sold at very high cost where it's missing is out of the race. So naturally, we will migrate more and more into areas where there is power for some reason that is just not utilized. And then the question is, what power is that, right? Is that coal that lies around and it's free and we just you know, burn it all up uh, and we maybe pollute the environment with it? Or is it something that is renewable? And that, I think, is not a question of Bitcoin mining. It's a question of energy policy. What kind of energy sources do countries allow and want? Right? It has literally nothing to do with this industry. It's a question of all industries. And I think just as every industry or every player in the economy has a responsibility there, there to take a decision and think, what do we want to support? So do Bitcoin miners have that. So, so what you're basically saying is there is uh, a, an incentive to use cheap energy and cheap energy tends to be uh, green energy or is, that, is this a simplification? So, I mean, when you think about cheap energy, what is cheap energy? It's unreliable, right? Normally, if you get like prime energy, it's very reliable and it's at the place you need it. And then cheap energy is not at the place you need it and it's not so reliable in general. And that's actually characteristics of renewables, right? So solar, wind, all of these things create this crazy problem of like it's available at some points and it's not, right? So this is perfect basically for Bitcoin mining. And that's actually then the question is like, okay, when this is very attractive for us and it's very good at the price as well because you can build solar fairly cheap, much cheaper than you could do gas, for example, right now, um, then do we want to go into that and actually can Bitcoin maybe be a facilitator of building more of that and making projects uh, feasible? I think Gif should talk a little bit about that as I think he's the prime example for that. Yeah, we will. Uh, first, though, is this assumption shared by everyone on the panel or is there some disagreement here? Well, I think actually um, there's a more important misconception at the bottom of that assumption that you say Bitcoin is destroying the environment. Well, Bitcoin is consuming energy um, and consuming energy or producing energy or using energy does not destroy the environment. I mean, um, we as a humanity have always consumed energy and we consume more and more and more energy and that's why our lives are getting better and better. <clears throat> so the idea that consuming energy is a bad thing is just absurd. Um, anybody who thinks that consuming energy is bad, I just challenge you to go and live how we lived 100 years ago or 50 years ago or 150 years ago. I'm pretty sure nobody wants to do that. So we need to have energy generally as a society. We need to have access to good, reliable energy. We need that to run our cars and go to the hospital and go up to the, to the buildings without having to walk the stairs. So generally the idea that consuming energy is bad, I think that's the main I think it's the main problem that in society nowadays everybody is, is kind of addressing, which is, which is wrong. Um, so I think we need to produce more energy, of course. We need to consume more energy. That's how we progress as society. And in that context, actually, it's very interesting because Bitcoin is kind of like kind of a, a free market force for increasing the production capacity of power um, without any, any subsidies from anybody. So it's a great way to actually have more production capacity and, and that's generally a very good thing for, for the world. Um, and therefore I think actually it's ultimately Bitcoin mining is a great incenti uh, um, incentivizer to drive us also forward and in tapping into good energy, reliable energy, cheap energy um, and, and drive us forward as a, as a society as well. 
So to what extent is Bitcoin mining today uh, driven by sustainable energy? Is there any, are there any figures on this? Is there a, do you guys know anything about this? Who wants to take it? Define sustainable energy first. <laughs> How do you define it? I don't know, I think it's one of those discussions again that is unfortunately too superficial. So we think about solar and PV and, and, and wind being sustainable. It is sustainable in, in many ways, but at the same time, like the, um, the wind turbines are made of uh, resin, which is a petroleum product. And at the end of the life, we bury them on the ground. So that's not so sustainable. PV cells, they have lots of mineral and, 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 and different kind of um, rare materials in them. So it's, you, it's produced using 80% coal power. So it is an important topic, so we have to think about what is sustainable and so on, but uh, it's difficult sometimes just to define that question, right? But I didn't want to distract from the question. If you look in the typical terms, um, oil and gas and then solar and wind, and we have a clear understanding of what is sustainable and not, um, then I think actually maybe the guys have some interesting statistics, but I think compared to general industries, um, uh, Bitcoin has a much higher rate of renewables in its, in its, in its consumption than, than traditional industries. So do we have some statistics? Does anyone know anything about this? Any insights? I might know a thing or two about it. <laughs> Go on. Yeah, so if you look at the traditional definition of sustainable, which is renewables plus nuclear, that's the same definition that Cambridge use. Uh, Bitcoin is now 53% driven by sustainable energy. And that's been endorsed by Bloomberg now. And that means that it's, as an industry, it's the number one user of sustainable energy in the world. So that's the first thing. Um, second thing, Give made a really good point, is that energy consumption is not the metric we should be using. Uh, environmentalists these days say, look, in order to enable a renewable transition, we need more energy consumption, not less. Because if you have less energy consumption, how on earth are you going to transition from a fossil fuel-based grid onto renewable unless there's more demand? So basic supply and demand economics tells us a renewable transition requires more energy users and a particular type of energy user, and that is one who's really flexible. And the key misconception here is that Bitcoin mining is taking energy away from other people, which is a nonsense. It is, by its very economic incentives, disincentivized to use energy when other people need it because your highest cost is electricity. And the last time you're going to use electricity is when everyone else is using it because that's when wholesale electricity prices go through the roof. So you naturally turn off, which means that it's a non-rival user. So it's not taking energy away from other people. It's incentivizing the renewable development, and it's 53% uh, powered by sustainable energy. And that's all because of its proof of work algorithm. There's a number of other advantages too. So yes, we do know a number of those stats. Uh, you, <coughs> you talk about 33% of renewable energy in mining? 53%. 33? 53. Ah, 53. Yeah. It's impossible to, to know this figure. There's no nonsense to give something so precise about mining. That's a minimum. Sorry? It, could be, it could be more. And I think it's more, but I, I can see only uh, the market. Because, you know, when uh, I have an offer on megawatts, um, on coal, we are not candidate. And our colleagues, you don't want to s some uh, new farm on coal. So I don't know. I don't know, miners uh, wanted to, um, they, they want to, to work on coal, it's finished. Uh, by the past, when I, uh, in the past, when I started, uh, Bitcoin was already uh, an ecological disaster in 2016. And why? Because the mining was in the inner Mongolia. And it was dirty, it was on 100% coal. Now, it's wrong, there, there's no mining in Mongolia. And, it's always the same. Bitcoin is an ecological uh, disaster. So we don't know. We absolutely, absolutely don't know where is the mining. You know, during years and years, uh, Cambridge explained to us it's uh, 30%, 40%, 50%, but we didn't know at all. They can find some mining in Germany, in Scotland, in England, and big. The, the, the mining in England in 2021 for Cambridge was bigger than the, than the Canadian mining on the, the study. So it's ridiculous. We don't know where are the machines. 
where are the ASICs? That's so only thing. in America. In America, it's clear, but uh, it's not the case uh, in Russia. It's not the case in Kazakhstan. It's not the case in in many many places. Give that you want to say something? I just want to say it's great that we don't know where panic is happening. Right, right, right. All right, let, let's move on to a different topic. So in the past couple of years, we've seen a lot of uh, mining companies go public. What does this mean for Bitcoin? What does this mean for the Bitcoin mining industry? Is it a good thing or is it a bad thing? Who has any thoughts on this? What does it mean? Interpret the question however you want. Shall we start at this side, Daniel? Uh, I think it's great. We need small miners, we need home miners, and we need huge miners who are publicly listed, and they all play a really important part. If you look at Marathon right now, who's one of the largest public mining companies, they spend a long time, and of course they have the resources, they can spend a long time uh, researching something. They've recently researched, for example, landfill gas mitigation and placed out a report. A, small mining, a smaller mining company is not going to spend the effort to do that level of research. So we need every single level of miner. Sebastian? I agree. <laughs> we need big and small miners. The difference now with these public uh, miners, the game is changing. By the past, in the past, where, when you were not profitable, you stopped the machines. And uh, we saw last year, big miners in America continue to, to work uh, in bankruptcy. So uh, it changed the game, that's all. We just have to know it. Yeah, I think, it, I think it's a two-edged sword. Um, there's benefits on one side, it kind of legitimizes the business. Um, it's good to bring in institutional money and so on. On the other side, of course, it makes it um, easier to be captured by, by any government or any, any intergovernmental inter institution that says Bitcoin mining is bad and we have like, I don't know, 80% in public listed companies and they have to give it away, the miners are conf confiscated or do some strange stuff. So there is a risk, I think. Um, that is like in the, in the worst case scenario, um, but that the other side is also like driving a lot of capital into the market and, and uh, legitimize it. I think the, the key thing is the distribution, right? Like it still needs to stay distributed. So it shouldn't be that there is one country or one company accumulating too much of the hash rate. And I think that is something that luckily is in all interest in, in really all investors interest as well. Um, maybe someday we will see that, that NASDAQ will decide that we'll not invest more into one company, just do not <laughs> turn down the, the evaluation further. So I think that's the very important thing for me, public, private, um, both have the very important roles in it. So, so to tie into that, I'm not sure if that's what you're saying, but so that, let me just ask. So don't you think mining today is too centralized? There's only a couple of pools that control most of the hash rate on the network. Uh, Bjorn, let's just start I, with you. So is mining too centralized nowadays? We don't know, right? I think we don't know. Well, um, we know we know about the pool distribution. We, we have a good we, idea. We know about, about the that. pool distribution, and we know that it's generally more centralizing. And we definitely also know that it's happening a lot in the United States for the last years. We also know that there is a lot of accumulation happening in the United States. So there's of, co of course a huge interest, right? Which I think the rest of the world is still kind of in this idea: the United States doesn't like Bitcoin, and we cannot touch it because our big brother doesn't like it. So I think this is slowly maybe changing, and there are more companies. Uh, in the rest of the world also waken, waking up to a reality that, hey, this is actually a real asset class and this is a real industry and this is interesting for us because it opens possibilities we didn't have before. Um, so I think that there will be, again, a movement of you know, more countries opening up to this idea, more, more interest and more distribution as well. And I think there are also many um, very aware parties in the, in the industry and in the community that are, are making a dedicated effort to make sure it gets more distributed, which I think is very important. I think we all have a responsibility to ensure that our actions lead to a, as much distributed network as possible. Give is mining too centralized? Is there something that needs to change about that? And if so, what? Um, yeah, well, regarding the pool question, I think um, the pool, the pool question doesn't worry me too much because everybody who does mining knows that. Like you usually have one pool and then a fail-safe pool, like a, like a fallback pool. And if one goes down, you just switch to the next one. So the barrier to switch pools, switching pools is very, very low. Um, and therefore, if there is a bad actor pool, then you just switch to the other one. I mean, it's, that's, that's very quick. So I don't worry about that too much. Um, I think yeah, definitely we're seeing a bit of 
centralization in North American publicly listed companies. Um, it's still better than what we had in China, 70%. But what is very interesting, I mean, somehow Cambridge is not updating the data, but what is very interesting when you look at the, um, the countries with the biggest distribution or biggest, biggest concentration of, of hash rate is like US, and then it's like Russia and Iran, and now probably a lot of South America. And that's great because like you literally want to have political enemies having big parts of the Bitcoin hash rate. That's literally what gives it its, its kind of resiliency. So. Um, I think that's good, um, and as long as the, the North American hash rate doesn't grow too much, um, probably, probably it's fine. Like, it's, we're in a better position than we were probably with 70% of hash rate in China. I think um, you can see a concentration, it's not a centralization, it's totally different. In a public miner, you have many investors, so it's not, for me it's not a centralization, and it stays uh, really well distributed in many, many countries. There's few industries so distributed. Daniel, yeah, is all, it too centralized? Well, all I'll add is to give context. So if you compare it to other industries such as smartphones, such as the automobile industry, such as search, it's way less centralized than any of those. Um, the, the concentration, if you look at the four large public mining companies, they probably own perhaps 20, 30% max of hash rate. If you look at the top four automobile makers or the top four smartphone makers or the top four search engine creators, you know, it's way more centralized than that. Um, so I don't really see a big issue there. And I think the trend is going to be increasingly uh, towards decentralization for the reason you were mentioning before, which is people are going to chase stranded energy. And that's going to be in really odd and convenient parts of the world. Yeah, real quick. At my, at my mind, we have the same issue uh, in the construction of ASICs. It's, uh, it's only in China, and uh, this is the risk of mining. The risk is not the concentration in America or yeah, that's in China. centralized. The risk is in the concentration of the, all the factories are in China, and uh, it's a pity. All right, we've got time for one last quick question. Uh, the halving is coming up. Is this, how, how should miners think about this? How do miners think about this? The, the, the supply of new Bitcoin is going to be slashed into half, so less income. Presumably, is this something miners are concerned about, should be concerned about? Should we start here, Daniel? Yeah, miners are this unique creature that they kind of lean into this industry that guarantees that in four years' time you're going to get half the amount of revenue. <laughs> it's incredible, and they're just like, yeah, bring it on. Uh, but the thing is that it, it, a whole lot happens. So during these times approaching the halving, what you'll see is that they'll go into um, investment and, and maintenance and efficiency gains and hash rate may drop a little bit over this time. Uh, but people prepare for it a long time in advance. Some who have been um, not prepared well or have had higher Bitcoin, uh, Bitcoin price assumptions they may become unprofitable, but then as they become unprofitable, then the hash rate drops, and as hash rate drops, there's more for everyone, and it tends to normalize and work out. Sebastian? Give halving, are you concerned? Uh, well, I think every miner is a little bit concerned about the halving, <laughs> especially if the price stays flat. But I think the, good, the, the interesting thing about Bitcoin mining is like it's a purely competitive game. I mean, there is no absolute value that you need to achieve. You just need to be better than the half, at least, and then the having you're not going to care because you're going to have a margin. So I think if you're a miner, you should really try to push yourself to the better half, which means on, on, on a cost perspective, you should you should have less cost than other half of the market, and you can do that obviously by having access to low um, electricity prices, but also looking at other revenue streams um, and still service to the grid, selling your heat. So I think, and that's a probably the direction that we see also the industry going. All right, Bjorn, any last words? I mean, it's the ultimate, the, the ultimate competitive game, right? The race to the bottom, it's now about survival. So if you survive that time, then you will be able to feast, to fast, how is it called? To fast, then feast, right? When the markets go up, and I think this is what we really need to be concerned about as miners. We need to build something, or all the miners need to build something that is sustainable in the downtimes and then can be profitable when the, the markets pick up again. So if you have variable, you know, a chance to lower your cost, you probably should go for that, even if it means that you're giving up a little bit on the uptime. 
All right, well, that's our time. So thanks everyone for being here and thanks to the panelists.